All right, can I have your attention once again? We are going to start the program. I hope you all enjoyed dinner. Let me know if your steak was really bad. Anybody think their steak was bad? Good. All right, we are back. Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Harrison Schmidt. Harrison is a geologist with a PhD from Harvard University. He worked for the U.S. Geological Survey's Astrogeology Center in Arizona, where he was a project chief for lunar field geological methods and participated in photo and telescopic mapping of the moon. He was then selected to be a scientist astronaut by NASA and completed a 53-week course in flight training at Williams Air Force Base. He was backup lunar module pilot for Apollo 15, and then on his first journey into space, he occupied the lunar module pilot seat for Apollo 17. He was the 12th and last person to walk on the moon. In 1975, he resigned from NASA and ran and was elected U.S. Senator representing New Mexico. which is a small state in the uh, Southwest. <laughs> he is currently an adjunct professor in engineering physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Wisconsin, there are. That's, that's also called God's country. It's uh, slightly north of Illinois, and I was born in a small town in Wisconsin. I am pleased to report that Harrison Schmidt joined the Board of Directors of the Heartland Institute earlier this year. Thank you, Harrison. And Harrison uh, is going to give us a presentation on uh, the constitutional limits of climate change policy. Please welcome scientist, astronaut, and Senator Harrison Schmidt. Thank you very much, Joe. And thank you all for being here. This is uh, one of the more exciting scientific and policy conferences that uh, I can imagine attending, and I have attended an awful lot of them. <laughs> Joe, uh, I, was born, I was brought up in a small mining town of the West in that uh, somewhat larger state than you implied called New Mexico. <laughs> you remember that, remember that old uh, radio soap opera, My Gal Sunday? She was born in a small mining town in Colorado. Well, you can take it from there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I do want to uh, spend a uh, little bit of time with you tonight talking about uh, the Constitution and its relationship to climate policy. The, uh, uh, it's part of an ongoing effort that a small group of people that I am associated with have been uh, undertaking in order to try to understand major domestic and international policy issues in the context of the uh, and the viewpoint of the founders. Uh, and uh, it's been a very interesting exercise and let's uh, let's look at it from a standpoint of, of uh, climate change. First of all, I think we have to recognize that the founders had some very fundamental uh, ideas uh, about the Constitution. Uh, it included that government but was both necessary and dangerous. And you see that in, in their, not only in the Constitution itself, uh, but also in their writings. Uh, its purpose is to preserve liberty and to limit power. Uh, I think it's very clear that's what they had in mind. Define the basic rights, and that's the first uh, through eighth amendments of the Constitution. And uh, leave the natural intensive rights uh, to the people uh, and that was defined uh, in the Ninth Amendment. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, it's sort of the forgotten amendment in my uh, estimation. And leave uh, intrastate governing, intrastate governing power to the states, which of course was contained in the Tenth Amendment. Now there's no enumerated constitutional power related uh, to climate or energy in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 limits powers of Congress. It very specifically has clauses that define the areas in which Congress can legislate. 
There really are no open-ended clauses in Article I, in spite of the way they have been uh, interpreted uh, since. On, uh, the Commerce Clause is probably the one that is used most frequently to, uh, in broad interpretations, but its purpose, very clearly in the eyes of the founders, in my opinion, was to uh, make commerce between the states regular and not open uh, all state powers to federal usurpation. I'm not sure what that was all about. Article II defines pre no presidential powers specifically related to climate or energy. Now the question before us and before this group of people with whom I work, are there any implicit constitutional powers for legislating or regulating uh, uh, that exist in this arena? Well, Article I, Section 8 uh, does define federal science and engineering research. Implicit constitutional research requirements are in weights and measures, counterfeiting, these are all found in that uh, in Article I. Post roads, which I think we can broadly interpret as communications. Evaluation of discoveries, which is the patents. The support of the armies and navy. And here you see uh, that climate research is important in this regard. And so if there is one area where there is implicit federal research uh, power that is constitutional, it's in the climate and weather research that is related to uh, uh, the uh, common defense. And of course, uh, the support of the militia, uh, the militia being uh, state controlled until activated by the, uh, by the federal government or the president. Now, in pleasant uh, common defense research justifications, weapons and intelligence systems, uh, potential future military technologies, natural agricultural and other national defense uh, resources, military logistics and technologies uh, and transportation, the national uh, critical in energy systems, the science and technology associated with those, uh, and uh, national border protection and enforcement, uh, increasingly an area for uh, research. And uh, I come from New Mexico, you may realize. Uh, and medical research that maintains a healthy population. Remember that uh, national security is dependent on our population uh, uh, being as healthy as possible. And climate and weather as they impact all of those areas that relate to the common defense. Now, <clears throat> hmm. well, Article 1, uh, Section 8, uh, can we adjust that uh, screen a little bit, please? Apparently not. Somehow you've exploded on me. Anyway, as you've seen in the background, there's some pictures of the Earth that I took on the way uh, to the moon. I'm going in reverse. We're coming back home uh, in this respect. At any rate, that uh, Article I, uh, Section 8, uh, it's, it's Clause 18 that provides the regulatory power uh, to the, uh, uh, in a sense, that the Congress can uh, have relative to, to uh, uh, anything that is already uh, in the Constitution. It reads specifically to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and other powers vested in this Constitution. I have underlined those two uh, phrases uh, in the government of the United States or in any department office thereof. So it's very clear that Congress's power to uh, permit regu regulations to be issued by an administration uh, relate only to the enumerated powers that exist in the Constitution. The climate and energy regulation is not constitutional except as related to interstate commerce. And there you have, of course, the regulation of commercial energy transport between states and it constitutes a clear federal regulatory responsibility. That's what the interstate commerce clause is all about. It has to do with making commerce regular between the states. Uh, climate, uh, federal climate regulation does not have a justification other than identification, a justification, uh, other threats to public safety 
uh, due to interstate commerce. Now, the, uh, are we going to be able to fix the – apparently not. We can leave it at that, and I'll uh, take it from there. <laughs> Apparently, we found a Mac person. <laughs> you think Houston has a problem? They really do have a problem. I'll take it from there. You go. That's good. The Article Two presidential powers. There we go. Now, the thing we have to remember about Article II, it is constrained, of course, by the Congress, uh, by the constitutional amendments, as well as by the Congress funding powers. Uh, now, however, the President has, as we well know, considerable power. Commander-in-Chief has direct management authority over the national security agencies, negotiation of treaties, uh, authority over those executive departments implicit in Articles I and, and two enumerated powers. And that includes defense and state, treasury, commerce, law enforcement, and postal service. Somehow we let that one get away from us, the last one. Uh, presidential direction of climate research and services in support of executive functions would be implicitly constitutional. Now, one thing that off, uh, surprised me as I got into this was the power of appointments. The president by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint all other officers of the United States whose appointments shall be established by law. Very important, established by law. So legislative responsibility and constraints on the President's appointments are limited under Clause 18 to be within the enumerated powers of Article I, that is, the powers of the Congress. Most regulatory agencies are now unconstitutionally authorized to operate largely outside enumerated powers. That, of course, would include the EPA, <laughs> but sev several others as well. Now, the unconstitutionality of cap and tax and other energy regulation uh, restricting uh, energy production uh, exists because it vi they violate the preamble in Article One, Section 8, both of which provide, require the Congress, require the federal government of the United States to provide for the common defense and for the general welfare. Now, why do they violate? Well, reduced energy supply for both national security and the economy would be a, a, certainly an adverse uh, consequence. Added dependency on unstable and adversarial sources of energy supply around the world, limitations on economic vitality and growth, interested uh, increased personal expenses for all consumption, and in addition, targeted regulation of carbon emissions violates equal protection of the law. Equal protection of the law originally uh, existed uh, in uh, the Fifth Amendment and was and also in the Fourteenth Amendment. They've been taken as working together to apply equal protection on a national scale. Originally, the 14th Amendment applied it only to the states, but, the, but I think appropriately the courts have determined, uh, one of the, maybe one of the few things they've done appropriately relative to the Constitution, uh, that equal protection applies everywhere. Uh, the, uh, now, also we have to, in the, particularly in the context of this conference, we have to remember that the alleged scientific rationale for cap and tax is inconsistent with proven principles of science. I, uh, in every conversation I've had with many of you, I think uh, that is fairly a general proposition we can agree on. The, uh, 
there's no scientific justification within known natural variations to classify CO2 as a pollutant. That seems really weird. <laughs> Tests of global climate models and predictions fail, frequently at least. Uh, strong and testable hypotheses exist as alternatives uh, to human-caused global warming. Uh, strong evidence exists that natural climate variations <clears throat> excuse me, overwhelm human-caused uh, effects, and scientific debate has been stifled by political and governmental special interest. All of these make it, uh, all of these bring us very close to, I, I suspect, uh, ultimately having a case for fraud if we wish to pursue it. Now the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment, let's talk about that a little bit more. Targeted subsidies and loan guarantees. Equal protection of the law is denied for non-targeted entities, right? right? If you target, if you give Southern Company loan guarantees, which they're almost certainly never, won't work out very well for them, but if you give them to them, then everybody else has been left out of that. And that's, that's an equal protection issue. The uh, subsidies distort energy market, the energy marketplace, and uh, they raise indirect and direct energy costs. Uh, I just list a few of them there that uh, do that. And now we see the prospect, I know it's happening in New Mexico, it's happening in many other places, of energy rates being increased because of these subsidies. Believe it or not, it's happening that way. Nuclear loan guarantees, more specifically, as mentioned before, uh, nuclear, the best way to handle uh, the nuclear uh, opportunity that we have in this country and worldwide is to uh, uh, get rid of the regulatory restrictions, unnecessary regulatory restrictions that uh, uh, keep nuclear plants from being built. Uh, that's the easiest way to do it, and it's one thing, of course, the President never talks about. The Tenth Amendment, of course, is a very important part of uh, the Constitution, and the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved for the states respectively, are to the people. <laughs> Intrust state reg regulation is solely a state responsibility, according to the founders. Environmental regulations, intrastate, migrant labor regulations, intrastate, health care, education systems, and the like are all intrastate responsibilities reserved for the states under the Tenth Amendment. And the Arizona law is a very important uh, attempt now, and I think it hope ultimately will be successful. <laughs> important attempt to get that back into uh, the, tenth, the context of the Tenth Amendment. Commerce Clause of Article I, Section 8, permits federal regulation to create commerce uniformity across state lines, and that's it. That's what the Commerce Clause is all about. Just read it. That's what it says. And that's what the founders intended in their own writings. And that, of course, includes transportation, communications, energy transmission, uh, insurance, etc. If we wanted to f make a major contribution to uh, health care, reduction of health care costs, put health insurance into interstate commerce. Clearly, you can do that. That's constitutional. Now, in Article 6, Clause 2, there is what's called a supremacy clause that many people interpret uh, very, very broadly as always uh, putting federal law above state law. Well, that isn't what it says. This Constitution, this is, this is what Clause 2 says in Article 6. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, shall be the supreme law of the land. The Supremacy Clause applies only to laws that are passed under the enumerated powers given in Article I and in Article uh, II. And that's what the Supremacy Clause is all about, and that's why uh, this, this talk again to the Arizona law that the federal law is supreme, if it was enforced, it might be helpful, but it is, it, it, the state has the power to do what they will do within the state and within the context of the Tenth Amendment. 
It clearly refers, this Article uh, 6, Clause 2, clearly refers only to laws made in accordance, accordance with the enumerated powers of the Constitution. It was never intended by the founders to override the powers reserved to the states very specifically by the Tenth Amendment. Why have the Tenth Amendment if the Supremacy Clause uh, would override the Tenth Amendment. It makes no sense whatsoever, and I'm sure it did not, would not make sense to the founders if they were with us in this room. Now, there is a constitutional approach to climate change. Legislative mandate of objective federal climate research and continued testing of alternative hypotheses. Now, don't hold your breath for that's going to happen. <laughs> National security and interstate commerce are the primary justification for doing that. Begin federal civil engineering research program on methods to combat adverse consequences of, of warming or cooling, by the way. That's just something we ought to understand more about than we do today and would be much less costly uh, and an alternative to cap and tax. Nothing more really would be constitutional based on my current analysis of that wonderful document. We'll keep working on it. Now, I just want, for my own personal gratification, bring up the Ninth Amendment. Uh, as I said earlier, it's somewhat the, uh, the forgotten amendment. It deals with the naturally encompassing or intensive rights of human beings. Those of us who study thermodynamics know why I'm using the term intensive uh, as a right rather than intensive property. These, this is too often forgotten. It says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Well, the certain rights are the first eight amendments to the Constitution. What are these other rights? Well, I think we can say life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, which was in the De Declaration of Independence. There are other rights that are not mentioned directly in the Constitution. The right of association, of livelihood, privacy, thought, education, and travel. These are intensive rights. They're naturally human rights that human beings as a species have always uh, tried to exercise, some with more or less success. Now, the, the ones that I put in white there are the ones that relate directly to what's before us at this conference. Communication being part of what we're about here. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the constitutional battle strategy for conservatives might well be to contest legislation, regulations, and executive orders relative to original intent. I think we have to get to that. We have to encourage our legal foundations to do more, as much as they possibly can, and then more. Do not be intimidated by precedents, precedents particularly ones that strayed from that original intent. We also need to raise the national and international intellectual pressure to the highest levels possibly and possible and where else better to do it than conferences like this. Bring original intent and rationale into the public uh, debate. Scholarly and lay writings, sponsored speaker, speaking tours, educational institutions, and of course political campaigns. I call on all of you to get involved in that particular area this year and in 2012, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we can begin to reverse this uh, process as fast as possible. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll look forward to your questions. <laughs>